This is the Emergency Medical Minute, sponsored by Mile High Ambulance. Good morning. So we do have a medical minute this morning, and we're going to do a little rant on ATLS. I think we've had a couple of our providers recently go in and take ATLS either for the first or second time. So it's been on the forefront of my mind. It's also something that recently got presented on MRAP. So we'll kind of go through some of the issues to take with ATLS. ATLS is sort of a play on ACLS, which is sort of a different algorithm that we use for arrested or pre-arrest medical patients. And ATLS is sort of trying to do the same thing in trauma patients. So we'll start off with a quote by Ruben Strayer. He says that it's an algorithm. This is an algorithm. And so he says that an algorithm elevates the care of a novice, but it degrades the care of an expert. And so what he means by that is that this is an algorithm. And if we apply this to all comers, maybe that's helpful for providers who do things like in primary care, or if you have like an endocrinologist that somehow is en- ends up seeing a trauma patient, that algorithm maybe helps elevate their care. Does it, you know, make sure you go through the patient's case in a really routine way? Versus, you know, I would argue that trauma surgeons and anybody seeing patients routinely in a level one trauma center, we're experts. And so maybe, you know, painting with such a broad brush is maybe not necessarily helpful. So we'll go through some of the issues kind of step by step that we can take with ATLS. First one, starting with ABCs, airway. You know, we're taught in ATLS that if somebody has a compromised airway, you take that first before you do anything else. But we don't approach medical patients that way, right? Like if you have a medical patient that needs to be intubated, we have this old adage that we resuscitate before we intubate, right? If somebody is peri arrest and we just take their airway, they may, you know, have a cardiovascular collapse just from the meds alone. And so resuscitating patients before we intubate is probably the first way that we really diverge from ATLS. ATLS protocols. In the same vein as airway, C-spine precautions. I think we've seen recently a lot of people falling out of love with strict C-spine precautions. I think we'll continue to see the pendulum swing in that direction. But if you have somebody who's got, you know, maybe a C-spine fracture, and almost always in those cases, almost for sure a brain injury of some sort, what's going to be worse? The micro movements that you need to get the view perfectly that you need for your intubation or the hypoxia that will certainly ensue if the patient doesn't get a first pass success rate, right? Hypoxia and brain injured patients is a much bigger deal than any of the micro movements that we're using for our intubation views cutting clothes off. So patients who come in who are relatively stable and, you know, we've been taught, I was taught even in my training, like expose, expose, expose. But we expose those patients. We, you know, take some of their property, we destroy it, and then we have nothing to send them home in. So in stable patients where you can almost certainly say that this patient is going to go home after imaging, probably not cutting off their clothes is, is a decent thing to do. And I think we've really seen trauma also sort of start to move away from, from doing that. The log roll in patients who we've cleared their C-spine clinically, we don't need to log roll those patients. They can just sit up. We can kind of examine their back that way that's just as good the rectal exam this is sort of the thing I take the biggest you know issue with and I think we have moved away from it uh, in more recent years it's humiliating it's uncomfortable and I think for patients who are getting a rectal exam there's been a ton of studies sort of debunking the rectal exam and showing what a terrible test it is one of my favorites is from 2015 it's from Indian Journal of Surgery and it showed that these you know the rectal exam we kind of do it for two reasons right we want to test do they have this rectal tone and do they have blood and pen- penetrating trauma has something injured the bowel, do they have any blood? And so this study showed that this rectal exam, the DRE, missed 100% of urethral injuries, 92% of spinal injuries, 93% of small bowel injuries, 100% of colon injuries, and then my favorite part, 67% of rectal injuries were missed. And you got to figure like two-thirds of rectal injuries are missed. Like the one that it caught was somebody just sitting there looking, going like, it's got an extra hole in it. That This is a terrible test, right? Like, this is not really very helpful. We have replaced it a lot of times with this sort of, like, squeeze your butt cheeks test, which is better in some ways because maybe it's less invasive, but it tests nothing. It means nothing. This does not test a reflex. This does not test any sort of sympathetic, parasympathetic tone. It's just motor, right? Specifically motor of probably, like, L5 to S2. And we could probably get a fairly similar exam by just saying, like, can you move your legs, right? And if they can, do they need a rectal exam? Do they need this, like, squeeze your butt cheeks? No. The one time you will still see me doing uh, rectal exams is if we're pretty sure that somebody has a, some sort of spinal injury and I know that I'm going to be talking to a neurosurgeon and I do it because they're going to ask me for it, right? Do I still believe that a PAN scan is a much better test for these injuries? Yeah, but they're going to ask me what was their rectal tone, so I got to have an answer. Pushing on the pelvis, we had a case last week where 
the trauma team had skipped the pelvic exam and one of our ED personnel came like charging from the back of the room and was like, must push the pelvis and like jumped in there and like slammed on the pelvis. It's, if you don't, it, don't just assume that they have forgotten it. You know, there may be a good reason they're not pushing on the pelvis. In a patient who you do not suspect a pelvic injury on, it's, you know, at best it's probably just useless, right? And in a patient who does, you are suspecting a significant pelvic injury, bind it and get an x-ray, right? Like we know we shouldn't be pushing on pelvises that if we think they're open or significantly injured. And so not a great test. You'll probably see us start moving away from that. And then last, the FAST exam. I did an ultrasound fellowship. I love ultrasound as much as the next person. I studied nothing but that for an entire year. But I still think that the FAST exam is being applied to patients that it's not, it doesn't, it's not meant to be applied to. It was meant to say, okay, this is an unstable patient. We want to see if there's any sort of free fluid to tell trauma what compartment they need to open first, right? It was not meant to kind of help us guess where we're going to find injuries on the PAN scan that we're getting anyway. In that patient, we're just delaying care. And it's definitely not meant to be an exam that's just given to everyone. And then if we find something concerning, okay, that patient who wasn't going to get imaged is now going to get imaged. I think we see the FAST exam underperform a lot. And the reason is, is that it's being applied to patients that it wasn't intended for. So those are kind of all of the issues overall. I think, you know, to kind of circle back around, the reason that ATLS and ACLS, you know, have been, their names are similar. They, they're thought of in a similar way. But ACLS really has quite a bit more research and quite a bit more literature behind it. In addition to that, ACLS, at the very least, all of those patients are coming in as the same level of sick, right? Like even if they're an undifferentiated patient, we know that those patients are all either dead or peri-arrest. Versus ATLS is being applied to all comers. A lot of those patients can talk, can tell us what happened to them. You know, these are not as undifferentiated. And applying ATLS to a GSW to an extremity versus a significant blunt trauma car accident that is probably one of the reasons that this tends to underperform in the hands of experts because you really have a much better idea a lot of the times in trauma patients what's going on and the patients can really come in as much different levels of, of sick. So I think you'll start to see some of ATLS continue to be re reviewed and, and revised as we fall out of love with it over the next few years but some things we're thinking about as we are some people are going to take this test again. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Health One Continental Division and Swedish Medical Center for their financial contributions to the EMM. Donations from them and listeners like you make it possible for us to fulfill our mission of producing and spreading free medical education to the masses. If you enjoy our show, please consider making a one-time or reoccurring donation to help cover our operational costs and keep the EMM awesome. Click on the link in our show notes to make a donation. Thank you for listening.